cocoa? It's nice and warm. No, thanks. These are pretty good. You know, the birds think so, too. So let's save some for them. Don't most birds go south when it gets cold? Well, I saw some juncos this morning at the bird feeder. Now, they travel up to Canada in the summer and come here in the winter. So for them, this is south. Well, if I were a bird, I'd go someplace where it was really warm. Hey, how do birds know how to get where they want to go? Or fish? Or whales? Yeah, they can't read a map. And sometimes they really go a long way. Well, for that matter, how do we get where we want to go? Well, I fly, just like the bird. Ladies and gentlemen, this is First Officer Willis Brown. We'll be airborne momentarily. The weatherman has assured us that we can anticipate a smooth flight along our planned cruising altitude of 37,000 feet with ground speed approaching 600 miles per hour. I'll talk to you from time to time to announce various points of interest along our route. I hope you enjoy your flight. Hey, what's going on here? Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a good flight. Three, two, one. Now, here's Atlanta, and where's Seattle? Now, here's Seattle. Now, to get to Seattle, you can either go due north and then west, or directly west and then due north. I'm showing Twiggy how we find our way around the Earth. Now, I've already shown you how to use the globe to find out where you are. Once you find out where you are on the globe, you can use a compass to plot a course. And along that course, you find landmarks, and at every landmark, you take a new reading of the compass. I get it. I get it. Good. Now, all you need to do is book the hotel rooms and pay for the gas. Funny joke. This is First Officer Willis Brown. He's a pilot, and he flies passenger jets to and from Los Angeles, California to New York. This is Lisa. Hi, Hello, Lisa. And that's Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you? Nice Good. Nice you. Hey, you must get to see a lot of the country then. Not always. Quite often at seven miles above the ground, there's a cloud cover underneath us which conceals from us such things as rivers and lakes and towns, so things that are usually shown on a map. Yeah. Well, seeming as L.A. and New York are 3,000 miles away, how do you find your way from L.A. to New York? Right. Forget if it. you were going from L.A. to New York, how would you find your way? Good well, if I was taking the interstate highways, I'd go from Los Angeles to Albuquerque. To Oklahoma City. To Indianapolis. And to New York. Hmm. And I take a highway in the sky that is called an airway. A highway in the sky. A highway in the sky that's called an airway. And this map shows the airway structure from Los Angeles to Albuquerque to Oklahoma City to Indianapolis to New York. These are all air routes in the sky, all these lines? Yes, we fly simply from one strong radio beacon to another radio beacon, and a straight line between these radio beacons forms an airway. And there are some airways that go all the way from New York to San Francisco, New York to Los Angeles. Now, you, the routes that, that you mentioned sounds almost exactly like the route he would take driving, but in the sky. Yes, there are, we would deviate only uh, for weather circumstances. Oh, so like if there was a storm, say, near Oklahoma City, you might go around the storm and change your route? To the north or south, whichever way the air traffic controller has told us, we can anticipate the smoother flight. Well, how do you know uh, how you're going to get from one place to another? Do the, we fly a computerized flight plan, which has already been predetermined prior to the flight. We don't have computers on board the aircraft that provide this particular function. Is so we have... Is flying blind when you don't have a computer in the... In the plane? Flying blind is an expression that makes a lot of passengers nervous, Trini, but <laughs> would make me we, everyone. <laughs> we are able to fly without being able to see the ground, simply uh -huh. by tuning in one of these powerful radio stations and flying along a route that is described on our map and following this computerized flight plan. Now, what's that Which, flight plan for? This particular flight plan goes from Los Angeles to JFK in New York at 37,000 feet. 
This particular one is a 747 flight. So you get this flight plan before, before. you get on the plane. So you mean you could yeah. fly one of those planes even if it didn't have windows? I could, although without windows I wouldn't be able to see the pretty lights of the towns below or the stars at night or it's nice to have a window when you want to see the ground and land. That's but, true. But, <laughs> but we are able to fly without windows through the utilization of electronics. That's a lot of things yeah. to keep up with. It must get sure. pretty complicated. Yeah, but you know, I know some animals that can fly that far without using all that gear. Why do they call them homing pigeons? Uh, well, these pigeons have a special ability in that you can uh, take them away from their home and take them out anywhere in the countryside and let them go and they are able to find their way back home. So I guess the, uh, the best plan for right now would be to grab about 10 birds and we'll put them in the, uh, the boxes and uh, take them out and see how, how they find their way back. Okay. So what do I do? Just <laughs> uh, Okay, well, wait, wait. There's, uh, there's no preferred uh, technique. You just got to try and get close to one and... Uh, then... Would they peck me? Uh, no, they won't peck. They're, they're pretty docile. Ow! <laughs> you trying to sit on my head. Oh, great. Uh-huh. No, I guess not. Okay. Try over here. Come on, you guys. Come on. You're pretty one. Oops. Got it. All right. Okay. All right. Come on. Ouch. Don't scratch me. What if I scratch you back? <laughs> what are we going to do with the pigeons now? Uh, well, we're going to put them in a car now and uh, take them out to the release site about 50 miles away and let them go and see how they, how they come back. 50 miles? Well, that's, that's really nothing. Uh, we can take homing pigeons up to about 1,000 miles away. That's, that's like going halfway across the country almost. That's right. And they can find their way home? Yeah, they, they do just fine from there. How, do, how are they going to know how to get home? Well, we think that they might use magnetism. How do they use magnetism? It's just like having a compass. Yeah. You know how a compass works. Yep. It tells you which direction is north and which direction is south. Right. By using magnetism. And we think that the pigeons have something like a magnetic compass. Inside? Inside their, their heads? heads. <laughs> yeah. Now we gotta put the two halves of the antenna together. Okay, I think it's about ready to go up. Okay. Got it? Yeah. And what is the antenna gonna do again? Well, gonna this is gonna tell us which way the pigeons are flying by, uh, by tracking their radio transmitters. Oh, okay. Okay, this is the transmitter. Let's, uh, let's see if this one's working. Uh, you want to turn on the receiver? That's here. Uh, this right here. Yeah. Right, and this one is frequency one, two, zero. So just turn these numbers to the one, right. two, zero. Oh, there it goes. That's the sound that you follow when you're tracking the bird? That's right. Sounds Good. like a cricket. Yeah, a bit. I think we're, uh, we're ready to glue this onto a pigeon's back then. Okay, do you leave okay. this on? That's right. Okay. Why don't you get one out of the box there? How are we going to keep the transmitter on the bird? Well, we use a little glue to, to stick it on his back there. That won't hurt him? No, it just uh, wears off and, you know, falls off after a while. Oh, okay, well. Okay, I think we're ready. Right. And that'll hold on? Yeah, okay, that's on there. He's, he's ready to go. Now, can I just, I want to let him loose, but can you just turn him around so he can fly? Or do I just let him go? You can anyway? let him go anyway. Okay, okay. all ready? So the birds are on their way home now? Yeah, they're on their way home. How do you know that? We know because when we mess up their magnetic information, it uh, disturbs their ability to get home, and it, it confuses them, and they don't go home as well. Could, could, is there any way you can show me how you do that? Sure. What we use in this experiment is a coil, which is attached to a little battery pack here. Yeah. And this coil has an electric current running through it, and that makes it act like a magnet. And then this magnet will be, this coil will be placed on the bird. And that interferes with it, messes up the bird's magnetic compass. Um, and let's see what it does to our compass. We use electricity to disturb the pigeon's compass. And you see? So that now what was north before is west. When it should be north, it's saying west. Right. And so the pigeon is confused and he has trouble getting home. 
And what will happen if he never gets home? Well, he's confused at first, but then uh, he, he straightens himself out and he gets home eventually. So they, they can, after a little while, they figure out that something's messed up and they'll All right. fix it. They figure out that we're playing with their compass and they, they compensate and get home. Okay. okay. Now this big coil slips over his head and... Uh, Is that comfortable for them? Well, it will be as soon as I get it on. It won't bother them at all? No. Oops. Oh. Yeah, you can be careful. Okay, now the smaller coil goes up on his head here. All right. It looks like a little hat. <laughs> yeah, and the battery pack goes on his back. Okay, he's all set to go. Should I let him go? Sure. Ready? Do you see only birds that do this, or is it just homing pigeons? Uh, no, actually, probably uh, most birds have, have some ability to find their way from one place to another so that they can uh, return to a good breeding place or you know, a good place to find food. And it's not just birds, it's, it's all kinds of animals. Well, thanks a lot for telling me all this stuff, OK? Sure, it was great. I'll see ya. What is all this stuff? Pilot's toys. <laughs> toys, <laughs> toys, huh? <laughs> Do you fly any other kind of plane other than your big 747? I fly a light airplane quite often, Mark. What kind is it? It's a four-seat single-engine aircraft. Oh, that must be nice. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah? Do you yeah. use different instruments on that plane than you would on the larger plane? Oh, I use a compass, for one. Well, that's like pigeons. This is much like a scout's compass. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's uh, utilized pretty much the same way, except in the light aircraft that is on the instrument panel. Oh, I see. Okay, so now, if you were going to fly your plane from one place to another in the small plane, how would you know how to get there? Did they give you a, a computerized flight plan like in the big plane? No, not in light aircraft. Light aircraft, you would use a, a map that would show the terrain, it shows the rivers and the lakes and the highways. So they, it would simp in the small plane, you, could, you can see the lakes and the rivers? Yes, on a nice day, if you're flying in good weather, you can see the ground at all times. So you're flying closer to the ground than you would flying the 747? Much closer. Yeah. Mm. So how do you use this, this chart here? Simply take a Weems plotter. A what? <laughs> a, this little device. You put it on the map, draw a line between the points you choose to fly, and mm -hmm. measure the distance and select the heading and simply take off and put the compass on that heading and there you are. And you have straight for it. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds easy enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What other kind of things do you use? We, we use a... Jepson computer also, which... That's a computer? This it doesn't look like this one. This is a computer. This little gadget has a wealth of information available to the pilot simply by manipulating the controls. You can get anything you need to know. But primarily, it's used for wind conditions at the altitude you're flying. You would like to know how the wind is affecting your flight. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Now, in the old days, they didn't have all these things to help them out. What did they right. do then? Yeah, well, in the old out. days, aside from flying with the utilization of a map and looking at the ground, they had on board what was called a, ra a radio. A plain, a plain old radio? Like Just plain old radio. It was called an ADF. What did they do with it? Yeah, right. So they listened to the radio, but didn't <laughs> know where they were going. They would dial in a known radio station, AM radio station, at their destination. And in the cockpit, a needle would point to the station. And they would simply maneuver the airplane to put the needle on the nose of the airplane. They'd fly that heading until the needle turned around. And that would tell them, we just passed that radio station. So then they would just look for the airport once they knew they were near the town? Look for the airport and then visual reference and land. They so really they're... depend on, their, on what they can see in yeah. a small plane. Early pilots depended on their primary senses, their basic senses so they for couldn't flying. fly very high. No. That's pretty simple navigation. I mean, even for sailing, you have to use a chart. Hoist away! Go through it! Hand over hand! Faster! Take up the peak! Yeah, up Keep there. going on the peak! Hold it on the throat! Yeah.
After a day of sailing, we had to think about getting home. The first step was to look for land. How far are you guys taking me up here? Um. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I think that's good. <clears throat> Not much around. Kathy, I think I see land. Yeah, definitely. There's some land out there. Well, listen, Mark. What are you supposed to say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> land ho! Great. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's more like it. Do you see it from down there? No, I can't see anything from here. That's why you went up. You can see a lot more way up there. You're right. It's beautiful. Why don't you come down and let's look at the chart and see where we are. All right. Okay, Mark, you sighted land, and we've now gotten the chart out to see where we are. The chart looks like a map. Well, a sailor calls this a chart. But let's look around a little more, see if we can get a good view of, of something else that'll help us out. Uh, what's that right there? Oh, there's a buoy. It what looks like it? it's uh, black and white. Okay, yeah. black, white. Well, let's come down on the chart and see where a black-white whistle would be here. Here we have one. Okay. Okay, well, that's on our port side, so why don't we put this to show us where we're going. So where are we headed? Well, we're going home to Mystic, right over here. Right. So can we just go straight like this? Well, there's a problem, though. All these rocks are between us and home. Uh -huh. So there's a good passage in here, Watch Hill Passage. Why don't we head for that and around that red bell? All right, well, how are we going to get there? Well, we're going to take our course. Right from there to there. Two. And that lands right on the north-south line. Oh, I see. So now we know we have to head north. That's right. Well, do you think we can see it from here? Well, we can't quite see it from here, but we can get there another way using the compass. We've plotted a course of north to this bell buoy. Uh -huh. So here, we've got our lubber line right, lying right on zero, and that's what we want. Well, we can't head much further north than that. We're right on it. Mr. Carver and home. Last summer, I flew down to the Caribbean a lot. So you flew over Puerto Rico? I flew from New York to San Juan and over to St. Croix. Oh, neat. You know, I went to Japan once, and we flew over the Pacific Ocean. Really? Yeah. Then you must have gone from New York to San Francisco to Hawaii, and then over to Japan, right? No, we went by way of Alaska. Alaska? That's north. You wanted to go west to Japan. Nope, that's the difference between a flat map and a globe. You have to remember the Earth really looks like this. Here, Mark, let me show you. Okay, we'll take this piece of tape and we'll do your trip first, okay? okay. Trini, put this on New York. Okay. Okay, so you go from New York to San Francisco, mm. right? Down to Hawaii, and all the way over here to Japan. Now, we'll break the tape here at Japan and see if my trip was any longer or shorter. Okay. Back to New York. Here we go. Okay, okay now hold this on New York again. Okay. Now, I just went straight from New York all the way up to Alaska like that, and then over to Japan here. Okay. Now, that's how much longer your trip was than mine. Yep. That's called a great circle route. We like to fly that way to save fuel and time. Gee, I wonder if the Bloodhound Gang is that smart. Whenever there's trouble, we'll the double with the Bloodhound Gang. If you've got the crime, we've got the time with the Bloodhound Gang. Oh, Jimmy. 
Bloodhound Gang was hired to make sure there was no trickery when Princess Tomorrow predicted the results of a future horse race. Vicky noticed that Professor Diablo had moistened the flap of the envelope with his tongue, but used a sponge to wet the stamp. The princess's prediction was sealed in an envelope and mailed to the Bloodhound Agency for safekeeping. The next day, Princess Tomorrow's prediction matched the race results, including the spelling error printed in the newspaper. Gamblers, seeing a sure bet, offered a large bankroll if the princess would predict the winners in the next horse race. Come on, boys, let's get rich quick. We're gonna get rich now. I'd hate to be in your shoes if they get poor quick. The Bloodhound Gang was sure that the professor and the princess were tricksters. Back at the office, Vicky experiments to try and discover the swindle. Now for the conclusion of The Case of Princess Tomorrow. are back. They look mad enough to bite nails. What if... Yeah, what if the professor wiped all the glue off beforehand? You're in trouble. What do you mean? None of Princess Tomorrow's horses won. My gambling friends lost bundles of money. And they don't lose like gentlemen. I can hardly believe that grown men would fall for a swindle like that. Nobody can see into the future. It had to be a trick. And I've got it. I know how they did it. What you better do is get lost. Downtown fans phoned to tell me the professor and the princess checked out of the hotel without paying their bill. Don't worry, we have two detectives shadowing them. And find them before the horse players find you. Let him detective agency when... Oh, Ricardo, great. Are you following them? What? What do you mean they never left the hotel? Impossible, I'll be right there. And I'll give you a lift. If they left the hotel, they had to grow wings. Maybe they didn't leave at all. Where's the last place anyone would expect to find them? Right here? In the hotel? In a different room under another name. Worth a look. They'd figure on sitting tight until the heat is off. There must be 500 rooms in this hotel. Now all we've got to do is find the right one. I know how to find them. That yappy dog. Remember yesterday when I blew this whistle? That dog Cleopatra really barked. Good idea. Let's go. Are you blowing it? Are you sure it works? I'm sure. Cleopatra, I'd know that voice anywhere. I'll take over from here. Monsieur, Madame, room service. May I have the food tray, s'il vous plaît? Hey, can I put it out in the hall? No, Monsieur. Nothing is here. I tell you, I put it out. Professor, Princess, I'm Sergeant Long of the Bunko Squad, and you're under arrest. Now come along quietly. Now. Wash the stamp fall off as soon as the water dries. There. And that's how the professor switched envelopes on us. I don't get it. Well, neither did we. Not the letter Ricardo dropped in the mail. It never reached us. Without a stamp, it would have been returned to sender. Right. Princess Tomorrow waited for the newspaper to come out and then copied out the race results. Including 
misspelling. Now I get it. Then Professor Diablo mailed us a second letter. So much for mind reading and fortune telling. Tricks. But I really can see into the future. When Mr. Bloodhound sees all the stamps you wasted, he's gonna jump out of his shoes. <laughs> Willis, how did you get into flying in the first place? Did you always like planes and things like that when you were little? Ever since I was six years old. How did you get into it? Well, I was walking through Kresge's Five and Dime on North Pearl Street in Albany, New York, and I <laughs> saw a little yellow wooden Piper Cub that I just had to have. Now, I was a perfect baby. I never gave my mother any We all were. Yes. <laughs> we but at that about. particular time, something washed over me, and I threw what I guess you'd call a temper tantrum to have that yellow wooden Piper Cub. You wanted it then and there. I wanted it did you right get it? then and there. I got my fanny spanked, but <laughs> I did get it for Christmas, oh, and it came to be my favorite toy. As a matter of fact, when someone asked, would ask my mother, where's Willis Jr., uh, she'd say, I don't know, honey, but if you find that little yellow wooden airplane, you'll find him. <laughs> and I flew that until I was, I, I actually flew it until I was <laughs> 12 years old, and I started building models, much like the one that's back here. I, oh, I still build, build models, yes. Really when did nice. you fly? What was your first experience in actually flying a plane? Uh, when I was in college, I took flying lessons, just as you would if you wanted to learn to fly. But uh, the, the way I went was after college and a private pilot's license, I went the military route and became a pilot in the Air Force and from the Air Force to the airlines. Is it easier to go from the Air Force to a commercial airline? I think so. You're going to yeah. hang in there until you can get I to hope the, so. uh, I, I'd the captain? I'd like to fly till I'm 80 years old. But, uh, Captain should not be far away. It should be four years. I should become a captain around 1984, 85. Is that what your stripes mean? On, on the stripes mean three stripes for co-pilot or first officer, depending upon which airline you fly with, what the title is. And the fourth stripe is the captain. And then with the captain, I'd get the cap with the little impressive things on it. The little, <laughs> like the globe has Japan, the captain has Japan and Hawaii and all these little oh, things. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's very nice. Really nice. Yeah, it's, it's impressive. I know it impresses the people that works for him. <laughs> <laughs> It was really good having you come here today. Yeah, I really mm. enjoyed it. It was fun. Learned a lot. Learned how to get from New York to Japan faster. Right. <laughs> 321 Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. It's a game show. It's a geography lesson. It's a mystery. It's the search for Carmen San Diego, and it continues today at 4.30. Now it's time for Square One TV.